The year is 1991. The Cold War is winding down, Nirvana is about to release Nevermind, and somewhere in Helsinki, a 21-year-old student named Linus Torvalds is about to accidentally change the future of computing forever. At the time, Linus was studying computer science at the University of Helsinki, and, like many students back then, he was using a Unix-based system called Minix. Developed by Andrew Tannenbaum, Minix was meant for teaching operating systems, but it had one big limitation. It was closed. You could read the code, study how the system worked, even use it to learn about file systems and process management, but actually modifying it or redistributing your changes was restricted by its license. It was open for observation, but not for collaboration. So Linus did what we all do when we have some free time on our hands. He opened TikTok. He started writing his own operating system kernel from scratch. It wasn't for fame or for the money. It was simply just a fun project. He wanted something better than Minix, something he could control, improve, and maybe even share. In August 1991, he posted a now legendary message on a newsgroup. Little did he know that his hobby project would end up being the backbone of everything from Android phones to the servers running Google and Facebook. To understand Linux, we actually have to understand Unix. Unix was created back in the early 1970s at Bell Labs by Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, the same duo that would also give us the C programming language. It started out as a small experimental operating system designed to be simple, efficient, and portable, which was a big deal at the time. In the 70s, most operating systems were tightly coupled to specific hardware and filled with arcane complexity. Unix flipped that idea on its head. It was modular and it followed the philosophy of do one thing and do it well. It introduced ideas like a hierarchical file system, user permissions, pipes, and tools that could be chained together. You could take a bunch of small, focused programs and combine them to perform complex tasks. That sounds obvious now, but at the time, it was revolutionary. Because Unix was written in C, a portable, high-level language, it could be recompiled and run on different hardware platforms. This portability made it widely popular in universities and research institutions throughout the 70s and 80s. But with that popularity came fragmentation. Different companies took the original Unix and made their own versions. Each one added features, changed interfaces, and created a mess of incompatibilities. By the late 80s, Unix had become a battlefield of proprietary implementations, licensing fees, and vendor lock-in. What had started as an elegant and collaborative academic tool was now just another corporate product. This, ironically, set the stage perfectly for something open, unified, and community-driven to come along. The shift toward proprietary control was exactly what Richard Stallman was reacting against when he launched the GNU project in 1983. Stallman believed that users should have the freedom to study, modify, and share software, so he set out to create a completely free and open Unix-like operating system. By the late 80s, the new project had built most of what you'd need for a full operating system, ranging from compilers to libraries, shells, and utilities. But it was still missing one crucial piece, the actual kernel talking directly to the hardware. New had everything except the engine to actually run it. That's where Linus Torvalds unknowingly filled the gap. His Linux kernel, combined with the GNU user land tools, created a complete free operating system. Contrary to popular belief, Linux technically refers to just the kernel, which is the core part of the operating system that manages hardware, memory, and processes. On its own, the kernel doesn't do much for a regular user. It can boot your system and talk to your hardware, but it doesn't give you a command line, file manager, or even a way to install software. All of that comes from the surrounding ecosystem. Software like the core utilities, the shell or the compiler were being developed by the GNU project well before the release of the Linux kernel. In fact, GNU was working on their own kernel called Herd, but it wasn't ready for practical use when Linux emerged. Put simply, most people running Linux are actually running the Linux kernel plus a bunch of new software. That's why, technically speaking, the full name of the OS should be GNU Linux. And yes, this naming debate has been raging for decades. Stallman insists on calling it GNU Linux to give proper credit to the tools that make the system usable. Linus, on the other hand, doesn't seem to care much either way. Most people just call it Linux because it's easier to say and doesn't make you sound like someone trying to win a technicality at a dinner party. Anyway, the first version of the Linux kernel was released in September 1991. It didn't do much. It could barely boot and only worked on specific hardware, but it was open source. That was the magic. Almost immediately, developers from around the world began contributing. Bugs were fixed and features were added. By 1994, Linux 1.0 was released. It supported networking, ran on more hardware, and people were actually starting to use it for real work. But it still had a bad reputation since everybody thought Linux was for hackers. 
It was difficult to install, painful to configure, and there was no such thing as plug and play. You didn't just install Linux, you had to earn it. So distributions like Red Hat started to appear, all offering a slightly different flavor of Linux and trying to make the system more usable for different kinds of users. A distribution, or distro, is basically the Linux kernel bundled with a package manager, software libraries, default apps, and some sort of installer. In other words, a distro turns the raw Linux kernel into something normal humans can actually use. Some distros succeeded and built loyal communities. Others faded into obscurity or merged into newer projects. Today, there are hundreds of them, but a few have stood out as particularly influential. Debian, launched in 1993, is known for its stability, massive package repository, and strict adherence to free software principles. Red Hat became the go-to choice for enterprises, especially after evolving into Red Hat Enterprise Linux, offering long-term support and the kind of predictability businesses care about. Ubuntu is based on Debian, and it brought Linux to everyday users with a strong focus on usability, regular releases, and wide community adoption, even if it did experiment with some polarizing design choices along the way. Arch Linux follows a rolling release model and gives users complete control over what gets installed. It's minimal by design and appeals to those who like to build their systems from the ground up. Finally, Fedora serves as Red Hat's upstream playground, often adopting cutting-edge tech before it reaches the enterprise world. Each of these distros reflects a different approach to how Linux can be used. From lean development environments, to polished desktop systems, and bulletproof server infrastructure. Together, they helped turn Linux into a truly universal platform. Despite its complexity, Linux had something other operating systems didn't. It was free, it was transparent, and it was evolving faster than anything else. By the late 90s, big companies started to take notice. IBM famously invested over a billion dollars into Linux development, seeing it as a way to break Microsoft's dominance on the enterprise market. Other companies followed. Suddenly, Linux wasn't just a nerd toy, it was a business strategy. Then, in 2001, something huge happened. A company named VA Linux went public during the dot-com boom, and the stock price exploded. For a brief moment, open source was Wall Street's darling. Of course, the bubble burst, but the message was clear. Linux had arrived. Around the same time, Linux found an unexpected home on the servers. It turned out that it was perfect for data centers since it was stable, secure, and didn't come with licensing fees. Tech startups rushed in to adopt it. Google, Amazon, and Facebook all ran on Linux. If you are building the internet, you are probably building it on Linus's operating system. And then came the wave of embedded systems. Routers, TVs, and smart devices started using stripped-down versions of the OS because it was free, customizable, and rock-solid. But the real breakthrough came in 2008 when Google unveiled Android. Yes, it might be surprising to some, but underneath the custom Java runtime and all the UI layers, Android runs on a modified Linux kernel. Today, Linux powers over 70% of web servers, almost all supercomputers, the majority of smartphones, and a growing number of desktop users. It's used by NASA, CERN, and the New York Stock Exchange. It even runs on the International Space Station. As a fun side note, when Linus needed a mascot for Linux, he picked a penguin. The story goes that during a visit to a zoo in Australia, he was bitten by a little penguin and thought it would be funny to immortalize it as the face of the OS. And that's how we got Tux. But, despite all its success, Linux never really cracked the mainstream desktop market. For decades, people complained about hardware compatibility, a lack of good software, or that installing drivers felt like performing digital surgery. Even today, most people run Windows or Mac OS on their personal machines, while Linux quietly does all the hard work behind the scenes. And that's kind of the point. Linux doesn't need the spotlight. It's the infrastructure, the scaffolding, the invisible glue that keeps the internet humming. Linus, who still oversees kernel development to this day, has become a somewhat mythical figure in the tech world. Known for his brilliance, bluntness, and zero-tolerance policy for bad code, he's both admired and feared in equal measure. That said, in recent years, he's taken a softer tone, admitting in 2018 that his communication style had hurt people and promising to be more respectful. So here we are. What started as a side project by a Finnish student is now one of the most important pieces of software in the world. Linux didn't just change operating systems, it changed how we think about software. If you enjoyed this journey through history, check out one of these videos next. Until next time, thank you for watching.